So let's look at keratoconus uh, from the beginning. Now, what's the cornea? The cornea is like the crystal on a watch. It's the front part of your eye. It's a clear dome-shaped lens, which in its normal circumstance focuses light rays onto the back of your eye. So you get a clear, crisp, and sharp focus. In keratoconus, the cornea, which typically has a round shape and a certain thickness, becomes thinner and weaker. And it can start to bulge like the thin spot on a tire or a balloon. Normal corneal thickness is 540 microns. In KC, it typically is below 470 microns. So the take-home message here is that the cornea in KC, rather than being of a certain thickness, smooth and round and clear, becomes thinner and weaker and starts to distort. That's what keratoconus means. Kera means cornea. Cone indicates the somewhat cone shape that the cornea uh, takes. And when this happens, that clear, smooth corneal dome that normally focuses light in one place scatters light. So light comes in, and rather than being focused, there are a number of different focal points, but the light is scattered. It's similar to having static on your television. Rather than having clear, crisp signal light, there is visual static, so to speak, and this visual static both diminishes your visual acuity, but also, as you know, diminishes your visual quality. So what causes keratoconus? Keratoconus typically occurs in around one in a thousand people. Uh, it's been reported in the old literature, and this is looking back into the 50s and 60s, that Casey occurred in about one in 2,000 people. But as we learn more, as more patients are screened, with the development of new technologies that allow for early diagnosis, I think certainly the incidence of Casey is at least one in a thousand, if not well over a one in a thousand. Typically, both of your eyes are affected, but it can be very asymmetric. So you can have one bad eye and one good eye, and there are few people who have one eye that has Casey, and the other eye really doesn't have signs of KC. Uh, typically, keratoconus begins when you're a teenager. Uh, it is a problem that progresses, so that bulge increases over time, and it tends to stabilize as you get older. The older you are, the more expected it is that your KC will have stabilized. But typically we see stabilization in your late 30s, 40s, uh, and 50s. Now with progression, the cornea becomes increasingly thin, increasingly steep or, or conic, uh, and increasingly irregular. And it really is the irregularity and that light scatter that diminishes your vision. People always ask, is this something that I can pass on to my kids? Well, very likely, to some extent, keratoconus is an inheritable uh, problem. Uh, there is an actual positive family history in, in about 10% to 25% uh, of people, but it is something that's not, not like blue eyes or right-handedness. It probably is multifactorial and has a variable expression. So if you have KC, not necessarily by any means will your children have it. But I do recommend if you have KC or your spouse has KC or there's KC, any place in your family to have your children checked, uh, typically after about 12 years old. There have been reports of gender differences in the literature. Some studies have found it more common in women. Uh, in, in our center, however, we find it more common uh, in men, so it's, it's unclear whether there is really 
a sexual predilection. And there may also be racial and, and ethnic differences in the incidence of keratoconus. Now typically, Casey is not really associated with other problems. It typically is an isolated disorder of your eye and particularly uh, of your cornea. There are some associations with other conditions, uh, in particular allergic uh, diseases. So many people with keratoconus also have both ocular allergies and systemic allergies. And this is something that Dr. Chu is going to discuss in, in just a little bit. It's also associated with other genetic conditions, Down syndrome, uh, let's call labors, congenital amaurosis, a number of connective tissue disorders where a patient will have uh, loose limbs and joints and tendons and, and ligaments. So let's go back now and, and look at the actual structure of the cornea and what occurs in the cornea to cause it to have the manifestations that we see of keratoconus. The normal cornea, as you see here, and this is a blow up, this is a photomicrograph of the normal cornea showing the corneal layers. This is the front of the cornea, which are the epithelial cells. So this is what you scratch if you scratch your eye or scratch your eye with a contact lens. Beneath this is the corneal stroma. So this is the bulk of the cornea. This is the structural support and the clear part of the cornea. The cornea is made up of 250 pancakes of tissue. So you can almost imagine the cornea as literally being pancakes of collagen stacked one on top of the other. And these are glued together by what I call biologic syrup. So you have pancakes, they're glued together by syrup. The syrups are glycosamine glycans, which are the natural sugars uh, that are produced uh, in the body. And in between these pancakes are cells. So these little dots that you see are actual living cells that are called uh, the keratocytes. To finish up corneal anatomy, on the inside of the cornea, we have the endothelial cells, which are cells that are important to corneal structure and corneal function, but really are something that in general are unaffected in keratoconus. Now the basic problem in keratoconus is that the collagen structure is abnormal. The basic biomechanical structure of the cornea is weaker and thinner. This makes the cornea unstable. So rather than retaining its nice, clear, round, dome-shaped configuration, it's weaker and starts uh, to bulge out. Just as this bridge, which is poorly constructed, isn't rigid enough, and you can see it's having some problems there in the wind. What causes this weakness? We really don't know, but there's a lot of research that's being done into the cause of KC and the physiologic abnormalities in the cornea that cause the problem. First is likely a generalized abnormal corneal structure. The pancake lamellar architecture that we normally see may be abnormal and distorted. The microstructure of each of the pancakes, that is the collagen struts, the fibers that make up the collagen pancakes, may be abnormal uh, in and of themselves. So rather than being a larger macroscopic abnormality, it may be a microscopic abnormality in the collagen itself, in particularly with linkages of the collagen to one another, what we call crosslinks, that we'll go into uh, in a little bit. There may be chemical and physiologic abnormalities that lead to these structural abnormalities. There may be abnormal enzymes in the cornea that act to degrade the collagen. There may be increased inflammation in the cornea that cause the formation of molecules that are called reactive oxygen species that work along with these degradative enzymes in order to cause both cellular and tissue damage. 
And also the cells, the keratocyte cells, may just not be working properly. So whatever the cause, these various physiologic abnormalities can come together to make the cornea weak and structurally insecure. There are some things that you may do as a patient that can also cause keratoconus to possibly occur, but certainly to get worse. And this is mechanical trauma, eye rubbing. If you rub your eyes, the rubbing can actually cause shearing of the collagen pancakes. So picture a bunch of pancakes that are stuck together by syrup and you start rubbing them, they can start sliding on one another. The shearing can also cause breaks in the connections of the collagen to one another and into the front of the eye. These are called anchoring fibrils, which are somewhat abnormal in patients with keratoconus. Also, poorly fit contact lenses and the mechanical trauma that they cause may also be something that could exacerbate the progression uh, of keratoconus. So as we'll see, one of the things that you can do to help to minimize your progression is not to rub your eyes. So knowing what we know regarding the cause of KC, what are some things that you may be able to do? As I just said, probably the most important thing is try not to rub your eyes. If you are allergic and it's the itching that's causing the rubbing, treat your eyes with anti-allergic eye drops and treat your allergy uh, with systemic oral medications as you're advised uh, by either your ophthalmologist or uh, by your, your allergist. Uh, get the best contact lens fit. Make sure that the contact is uh, not irritating your eye, uh, not causing uh, inflammation. The ultraviolet light from the sun uh, can also set up inflammatory pathways. So in bright light, uh, wear, wear sunglasses. And finally, as with other problems, it's very good to eat a healthy diet. Uh, particularly one that's high in antioxidants, green leafy vegetables, things like carrots that you always hear about uh, for the eyes because uh, these kinds of nutrients uh, can work against uh, those enzymes and radicals and inflammation uh, that may exacerbate uh, keratoconus. So how is keratoconus diagnosed? Uh, typically it's somebody who has a nearsightedness and astigmatism, and then all of a sudden they go in for their exam and they're no, or they're noticing that with their glasses uh, things are not clear. And that loss of clarity can't be corrected with normal glasses. So treating nearsightedness or treating astigmatism where the cornea is a little bit oval shaped rather than being entirely round isn't giving you the kind of vision uh, that you want. There are measurement devices that the doctor uses to make these diagnoses. Um, the first is called keratometry. This is a measurement of the steepness and corneal contour. It's measuring what's called diopters, which are just units of focusing power. And suffice it to say that in keratoconus, because the cornea is steeper than normal, the cornea has higher dioptric numbers. So normal is 47 or below on average. Keratoconus patients can be much steeper. But the more notable clue to KC is an irregularity of what we're looking at. So normally we look through this instrument, we see round circles. When KC starts, because the corneal surface is somewhat irregular, we start to notice irregularity of the reflections that we're looking at. The one innovation that's now close to 20 years old that really aided in the diagnosis of keratoconus uh, is computerized corneal topography, the so-called corneal maps. Topography of the cornea is very similar to topography of a mountain range. So this is like looking at a mountain range from a satellite. Red is high, like a mountain. Green is an intermediate gentle slope. 
and blue is low like a lake. A normal cornea generally is green. It's a gentle, smooth, regular, and symmetric slope. In astigmatism, one sees an area in one direction that's a little bit steeper. That's because this cornea is shaped a little bit like a football, but that's all astigmatism is. In keratoconus, what we see is the cornea becomes irregular. The cone part of the keratoconus develops a high area, so there's a high spot over the microscopic bulge of the keratoconic cornea, and you can see the irregularity as you proceed from the top of the cornea down to the bottom of the cornea. If you look at this map from which this is reconstructed, rather than having nice round circles, you can see the cornea is stretched in this direction, bulging right here, and that bulged area is indicated by a high spot, the red that you see on the corneal topography. So this is the diagnostic equipment that we can use for the earliest possible diagnosis of KC. We also use corneal topography to categorize what your keratoconus looks like. For instance, about 42 percent of patients have their cones in the central area of the cornea. About one-third have it somewhat outside of the central area, and about one-fourth have it way over in the periphery. So way down the cone is low and inferior in those patients. Somebody, some people consider this to be keratoconus with what's called a pellucid marginal degeneration pattern, or PMD pattern. And these are important to know when we're devising interventions, when we are planning for surgeries, and when we're fitting contact lenses. With computerized corneal topography, we can also monitor any disease progression. So very frequently you'll come in and we'll want to know, hey, is your keratoconus stable? Should we just watch and wait? Or is it a progressive? So we can look over time, for instance, this patient seen in 2009, 2010, we can see the red spot is bigger. When we look at the difference between the two, we can see that the cone has increased in size. We can also assess treatment success. So here's a patient before Intax, after Intax, and we can see the blue flattening that the Intax has caused. Another device that we use to monitor your KC is called pachymetry. Uh, corneal pachymetry is measurement of corneal thickness. Uh, we looked at over 5,000 eyes some time ago and found that average corneal thickness is 544. 476 is considered lowest normal. So if you're below 476, one starts to consider, hey, maybe there's keratoconus uh, that's involved. Pachymetry, corneal thickness measurements, can be done either with ultrasound or they can, they can be done with uh, optical pachymetry, which yield a corneal map showing us where the thinnest parts are and the thickest parts of the cornea are actually located. Another technology called wavefront analysis measures visual static. So this is much like putting a computer on your TV and asking yourself, how good is my TV? How high definition is it? How much visual? Static is on that television. Well, similarly, we can measure that static in your eye. A laser light beam is projected into the eye. It bounces off the back of the eye. It's captured by 200 little lenslets, which then make a map of your corneal static. Here's a normal cornea. You can see these spots are well arranged and symmetric. Here's an abnormal cornea. You can see how they're distorted. The computer takes these images and gives us a map of visual static. The flatter and greener the map, the more normal. The more irregular the map, the more static is in the eye. And we can also see the different types of visual static that there are. So if you go home tonight and look at a star or look at a moon, 
Most likely, none of us are going to see a very sharp point. Rather, you may see a little glow around the star. You may see a little comet shape around the star. You may see a little triangular shape around the star. These are all specific types of visual static that we can specifically observe and quantitate in your own cornea. And finally, there are new devices that can measure the biomechanics of your cornea. They can measure the stiffness of the cornea and the security uh, of, of the cornea. This is the, an air puff test uh, that one takes where we measure the bounciness of the cornea with the air puff, how it bounces in and out over time. And patients with keratoconus have a floppier cornea, so this gives us different types of readings. Taken together, examination, topography, aberrations, biomechanical properties allow us to diagnose KC, monitor progression, and plan what might be best in a certain circumstance. Because everybody's corneas are different, everybody needs to be evaluated individually and treated on that basis. Now when we're actually looking at the cornea under the microscope, there are a number of things uh, that we see. One, you can see Munson signs. So that's a little bulge that one sees when you're looking down because the cornea is bulged out a little bit in, in this direction. If we look under the microscope, we can see the cornea is somewhat thin. We can see the cornea has somewhat of a steeper pattern than normal. As the keratoconic cornea continues to steepen, it can start to distort those collagen pancakes that we saw under the microscope. And when it does that, you can see little ridges, which are called stria or vostria. That's because the pancakes are not aligned perfectly, so they're starting to stretch, much like cellophane might stretch if you wrinkle it a little bit. Hard to see here is what's called Fleischer's ring. This is just a little brown ring that develops under the cone. And as time goes on, as the cornea continues to thin and flex, you can note scarring at the tip of the cornea, as you can see here and there. And in more advanced cases, as it continues to thin and stretch, the internal layer that we saw of the endothelial cells may develop a little split this allows water to get into the corneal stroma in what's called hydrops. So hydrops is a very rapid thickening of the cornea, a rapid swelling of the cornea, where the keratoconic patient can notice a fairly rapid decrease in vision. It's nothing that's dangerous. It's something that's scary to have because the vision uh, decreases quickly because water swells the cornea, much like if you take a dry sponge and put it under water, but this is something that will tend over time uh, to resolve. 